Hello, and welcome to the No Bad Questions podcast, where I try to learn in a conversational manner to break down jargon and to present the least amount of filtering as possible on a wide array of topics. I hope that you learn something too. If you do and want to support the podcast, you probably already know all the ways that you can do so. You can like, share, subscribe, hit the notifications, but ultimately, and what I hope you choose to do, is watch to the very end. With that, we'll start today's podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the No Bad Questions podcast. My guest today is Dale J. Block, MD, MBA. Dr. Block is board certified in family medicine and medical management. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology at the Ohio State University in Columbus in 1982 and his Doctor of Medicine at the Medical College of Ohio in Toledo in 1987. He completed two years of general surgery training at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit before completing his residency training in family medicine at Good Samaritan Hospital in Dayton, Ohio in 1991. He completed his MBA in healthcare management from Western Governors University in Salt Lake City in 2016. Dr. Block has been a licensed practicing family physician for over 30 years. Dr. Block is also an experienced physician executive and healthcare educator slash speaker in the areas of managed care, population health management, clinical transformation, value-based in innovation, and healthcare stakeholder engagement. And we'll be talking about some of those today. He holds multiple clinical and administrative certifications, and in 2006, Dr. Block published his first textbook entitled Healthcare Outcomes Management, Strategies for Planning and Evaluation. In 2008, Dr. Block published his second textbook, textbook Healthcare Stewardship, A Guide to Improving the Health of All Americans. He is also the author of several publications and abstracts. Welcome, Dr. Block. Well, thank you for having me, David. Happy to be on today. I'm grateful for you, to you for making time, but I have to say amongst your areas of expertise, there's a couple I want to talk about, and the first is value. So what is value in healthcare? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> in healthcare, value is really very similar to any other um, space in that it is a focus on quality over cost. So as it relates to healthcare, you know, we're looking at healthcare outcomes that are positive um, and certainly life affirming at the lowest cost possible. So we talk about best care at lowest cost, that would be a high value organization from a healthcare perspective. And so, why does the average, you and I live in the healthcare universe. Why does the average person care? Why does the average citizen care about value in healthcare? Well, I, I think a couple of things, and I think it's a, a, a good discussion uh, point. Um, I would say that traditionally, you know, patients and families have not been considered part of the value equation in healthcare delivery meaning that uh, it's usually been the other stakeholders, whether it's a provider, whether it's a um, physician, uh, whether it's uh, a provider group, it could be um, somebody who's doing health policy, um, it could be in the government space, but narrowly did you see or have consideration for what matters to the patient and the patient's family. <clears throat> so within the last, I would say, probably three to four years, and especially as we've gone through, um, you know, the last couple of years of, of a pandemic and everything associated uh, with changes related to the pandemic and healthcare delivery, um, everybody has kind of stopped and really thought about how important co-design and um, inclusion um, is, probably the most important thing mm. that we can do to bring in the, the patient and family. So we call it person-centered care. 
where we're taking into consideration the the person's needs and preferences as a shared decision maker with the provider, with the physician, with the healthcare delivery system to make the best choices they can to be healthy and well. So we're we're looking at a different um, <clears throat> way of focusing on more health production and optimization versus, you know, uh, consumption of healthcare resources, uh, especially at, you know, end of life and, and certainly, um, you know, those that have a, a, a terminal um, disease. So that's why I think a lot of people are really starting to pay more attention uh, and working with their um, physician coach which is really, it's a coaching model <laughs> uh, to, to really try to get healthy and well <clears throat> instead of dealing with things when you're simply just sick. Yeah. And so there's a couple things in there that, that I want to pick apart and, and, and try to break down a little bit more. And one of those is, you know, value as we talk about end of life care, right? Because, or a terminal disease. This is not somebody, this is not a patient that we're going to cure. So when we talk about a positive outcome, what's a positive outcome for somebody who's terminal, right? What, what does that, how do we break value down for that individual? Well, I think a couple of things. One is um, we don't do enough end of life planning. So mm. um, if, you know, the uh, patient doesn't have, um, say, a, a um, a healthcare um, power of, uh, or a power of attorney for for healthcare, mm. um, and doesn't have uh, a living will outlining what their wishes are when they can't make decisions. I think that's that's part of it. So, oftentimes, what happens is is that we get somebody who is um, terminal. Um, they have not discussed how they want their end of life care to be. The family hasn't discussed it with the patient. So there could be strife within the family, um, you know, where some uh, instances, you know, you've got uh, part of the family going do everything and the other part of the family going no, you know, um, provide comfort measures uh, mm -hmm. and the like. And, and I think you're starting to see um, <clears throat> more palliative care uh, and, and end of life care um, that is co-designed. Uh, by the patient with their family and the provider uh, and physician uh, so that um, we can bring value into the equation. Um, you know, part of the cost, <clears throat> and there are estimates all over the place, but um, one estimate is that 80% of healthcare costs that you will, as a patient, um, you know, have uh, occurs within the last three to five years of your life. And a lot of that is because of failure to do end of life conversations that are really, really challenging <clears throat> before someone's at, you know, the, the bedside making a decision to put someone on a ventilator, um, you know, and have something uh, help them breathe. Uh, how much um, do they need to be treated for? How much does the individual want treated? Um, you know, a lot of people will say, do everything up to, um, mm -hmm. if my heart stops, leave me be, if I stop breathing, leave me be things along those lines. And so I, I know just because again, healthcare is, is my field. I've seen this. So my family, we've done that. I advocated for my parents to do that. They've accomplished that. That's a tough conversation to have with yourself about what you really want with your loved ones. Um, but in particular, what it also takes, at least in my experience, is you have to have some time and money to get with an attorney to set these things out. Are you aware, and, and maybe not, but are there programs or services available for folks who may not have an abundance of time or money to allocate to preparing a will, you know, to middle and lower income folks. Cause that's something I, and, until we're talking about it today, I hadn't really considered how do we make sure that everybody has access to do this type of end of life planning before they're at the end of their life. Sure. Well, in the state of Ohio, um, you know, there is a lot of um, free uh, services um, that will help you fill out 
um, you know, the appropriate forms that the state actually publishes. Um, they're online, available to everybody free. They're downloadable, so you actually can have a hard copy. It doesn't require an attorney to get involved. That's great. Um, it merely requires you and your family to have the conversation about what would you want when it's clear that you're at end of life. And then if you're not able to make decisions for yourself, who are you going to have be your trustee, if you will, or your healthcare power of attorney uh, to make those difficult decisions that you have discussed before you become incapacitated. Um, all it needs uh, is a couple of um, you know, uh, additional signatures. Uh, they don't, again, have to be an attorney. Uh, I think my wife and I did one, um, our most recent one at, at the bank, okay. where we got one of the bank officers and, and another to uh, do those uh, and execute those signatures. But uh, there are attorneys that do the work. Um, and some of that goes along with estate planning um, and financial planning, uh, and it becomes a part of it. Um, but you don't have to have an attorney do it for you in the state of Ohio. You can do it yourself, um, and um, you know you might want to provide the state URL uh, that uh, people listening could go sure. to download those forms because it, it it really is um, it, it's not very complicated. Um, and it does require you to have a conversation that many people are not comfortable with. But, you know, I'd rather have the conversation before the situation than not. Right. Similar to organ transplant, um, you know, if you haven't really discussed it, you know, with significant others, spouse, family members, and you're in that situation, um, you know, if you're um, considered to you know, no longer have brain function, I can guarantee you somebody's going to come up and ask you <laughs> or your family, um, would you like to donate organs? Um, you know, here's what we think, um, you know, is donatable based on, you know, the, the current state of affairs. Right. Um, and it's, it's a, um, a process that then um, kind of takes on its own uh, life. But again, you may have to have that healthcare power of attorney make that decision for you because you may obviously not be able to make it. Right. And, and so it's easier in a lot of ways, it's easier on them as well to have had it in advance. So no, that's, <laughs> and, and, and absolutely, at least for the state of Ohio, that's something that, that um, we'll put in the link in the, in the description. If folks are outside, if the listeners out there outside of Ohio, obviously you might need to do some Googling or whatever your favorite search engine is, but um, it sounds like at least some States are going to have resources for you. Um, so backing up then to another topic that you within value that you mentioned earlier is the idea of an increasing involvement of the patient in their care, either patient or person centered care, and that that has not always been the case. Um, what do you feel like just in your opinion is driving that increase in, in, the patient involvement? Is it a generational thing? Is it transparency via the internet? We can see outcomes more easily. I mean, what do you think is contributing to, to that? And, you know, cause I could very easily see a world where it just sort of stayed the same. You know, we sort of did what the doctor told us, you know, got the care that he or she, you know, pointed us to and, and, you know, took the meds they asked of us and, and all these things. So what do you think's driving that patient to be more central in the conversation? Well, you know, I think there are several things. Um, probably at the top of the list is the continuous rising cost of healthcare hmm. um, expenditures as a percentage of um, gross national product in, in the U.S. And in, you know, estimates are <clears throat> all over the place, <clears throat> but we're probably at around 19% of GDP right now. Mm -hmm. And by 2025, there is um, some forecasting that healthcare spending will become at, at least 25% or more of the, the GDP, um, you know, in the U.S. So the, the question after that is, so is more necessarily better? Right. 
or is it just more and more expensive? And I think the answer is the latter, um, which is why you're now seeing also a significant rise in consumerism that's related to um, certainly social media mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, the ability, I, I think, for people to uh, do a lot of their own research as it relates to healthcare and, and medical care in particular um, as to, um, you know, how do you manage uh, a particular chronic disease or, um, you know, I've been on the Internet and I think I have X, Y, Z. Right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, <clears throat> I when I was practicing, which wasn't too long ago, um, I would have patients that would come in and go, well, you know, Doc, I was on the Internet yesterday and this is what I this is what I think I have. And you got cancer. <laughs> I needed to then adjust, you know, my reaction um, to the patient so as to take into consideration from a, a cultural humility mm -hmm. uh, and empathy perspective. So, OK, so let, let's talk about it. Um, let's not make a diagnosis. Let's just talk about signs and symptoms that you're bringing to me today uh, for me to work with you to determine what the diagnosis may be um, and what further we need to do um, if we don't have a diagnosis or if we do, then here's some options for treatment. Um, you know, breaking away from the stereotypes of uh, the physician simply being a prescription pad um, and squeezing in as many patients as they can, you know, throughout the day <clears throat> in a volume-based world. Um, I think, um, again, consumers are smarter. They know how to go about doing research on um, health care and, and certainly their, their medical care, as I mentioned before. And they really want to be engaged and have a conversation uh, because a lot of times, um, you know, uh, you don't necessarily need the latest and greatest, um, you know, pharmaceutical agent uh, that's out on the market, or you don't need the newest technology that's just been cleared by the FDA for its use. Um, sometimes it's really very simple and basic, like, you know, if you cut down or cut out your smoking, uh, that might take care of several of the, the problems that you might have. Or, you know, do you have a problem with alcohol or substance use? Um, do you exercise? Do you eat healthy? Let's have those conversations. And that's why I think, again, you're starting to see, um, you know, where the, the patient and family members want to be a part of that care plan. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, if a, a patient isn't happy with, the decisions, they may seek out uh, another uh, physician. Um, and and there, there's more, I think, um, opportunities today for patients to do, you know, they're voting with their feet right. as to satisfaction uh, and the experience in and of itself than anything. We've been talking about quality for a long time. You know, the Institute of, of uh, Medicine under the, the National Academy of Medicine now looked at this many, many years ago and was able to talk about quality and the patient experience as part of the numerator when we're looking at the value-based you know, mm -hmm. equation. We're still not there. We're still having the same conversation that we had 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, and can't seem to, to break through. Um, and I think a lot of it is generational. So the next generation of healers needing to be more, I think, in tune with their patients um, and taking more time instead of spending more time in charting using the electronic health record, things along those lines. I think we're starting to see that shift for the reasons that I've been kind of rambling for the last five or ten minutes. <laughs> well, so one one phrase you used in there that I want to make sure we break down for non-healthcare people of the audience, which is a volume-based model, right? Which is basically the idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically the idea that whether – employed by a hospital or out on their own, the historical way that a physician um, or a non-physician provider is going to get paid is by seeing more patients, doing more services and, you know, billing insurance or billing the patient for those things, doing more, seeing more people. And so part of the, the 
value the new ways of paying physicians, hospitals, providers that's coming around or trying to move away from that. So just trying to break that down. But within that, then, do you do you think, I mean, you mentioned spending more time with patients, right, to have some of these uh, lifestyle questions because they are they can be such major contributors to quality and to that numerator of that value equation. Do you feel like we're really going to be able to do that? I mean, we, as I understand it, we have a physician shortage already, and it's looking to increase over the next decade as many physicians age from caregiver to patient themselves. Um, I mean, what's the practicality of that, do you think? Well, I I think that um, you may see um, different team members uh, come to the forefront to provide additional support and care. So, for example, in the state of Ohio, pharmacists just recently um, were allowed to have a Medicaid ID number, Mm. which allows them to then bill Medicaid for services that they provide under the uh, umbrella of a primary care physician or specialty care physician who is basically giving the order. So, for example, um, a a patient may go to their doctor, um, they're diagnosed with hypertension, they're started um, on some lifestyle change with or without medication, um, and told, well, you know, um, I'll see you back in three months. Mm. Um, well, you know, three months is a long period of time. Um, and <clears throat> I think patients today agree that it's a long period of time. So they're looking for alternative providers to help them be part of their health coaching team um, as it relates to managing chronic disease in this case that we're talking about. Um, but, and so the pharmacist can now come in uh, under the umbrella of the uh, primary care physician and help uh, with uh, changes maybe to medication, uh, changing the dose, making sure that they're following through on lifestyle change and behavior. I think that <clears throat> we're going to probably see, um, and, and it will take a, another generation or two of you know, physicians that are training um, to look at health production and health optimization as part and parcel of what we're calling the quadruple aim, you know, which is a transformation of healthcare towards the patient experience, towards the provider experience, care of populations, um, and certainly a lower cost, um, you know, per patient for that care. Um, And, And I think that if we're more focused on how to produce health and how to optimize health, we're going to probably want to cover four major areas that really help align with that. And that is health prevention. So we're looking to either screen for diseases um, or with disease, you know, what other, you know, entities can we do? to, uh, or what other activities can we do to prevent the disease from getting worse? Health promotion, which is really lifestyle change and behavior. So how are we eating, exercising? Are we smoking? Are we uh, using, uh, overusing alcohol or, and or illicit substances? Um, You know, are we um, careful about our sexual behavior, um, things in, in those terms? Then health protection, which is where we now bring in the concerns of climate change, Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, what is uh, the potential uh, ramifications of warming by a half degree centigrade to one's health um, in an environmental, um, you know, umbrella. Um, You know, what are some of those changes that are taking place? And then finally- for those out there, just to interrupt you, I believe, those are some of the least disputed uh, elements of the climate change debate is that, you know, people in coastal areas will have impacts, people in flood zones, people in. So just because somebody might hear that and go, ah, climate change. I'm pretty confident I am not a environmental scientist, but that that is one of the least disputed elements 
of the whole climate change scenario because it doesn't matter whether we're causing it, the sun spots, you know, who cares? Hotter summers, you know, create more opportunities for ticks to bring Lyme disease further north, you know, things like this. So sorry to interrupt you, but I just um, I want to make sure that people are thinking of these in the context, uh, the, these points that you're making, which are good in the context of the, these are pretty solid patterns in, in the global and national landscape um, out there. So sorry to interrupt, Dr. Block. That can, I mean, that can be a whole separate, you know, conversation <laughs> for hours. Um, and then the, the last thing that I mentioned is health preparedness. So, um, you know, think back to um, uh, looking at the, the, the last uh, natural disaster. Um, it could have been tornadoes last week. It could be the wildfire in Yosemite uh, that is threatening the sequoias. Mm -hmm. um, that, again, um, you know, gets back to um, their role in, in um, greenhouse gas um, emission um, right. mitigation and such. Um, are you prepared just, just for any calamity? Um, <clears throat> and if you are prepared, um, you, know, uh, you know, there are certain things to make sure um, that you've got available to you should you have to be involved in that um, particular calamity. So those, I call those the four Ps uh, of productivity and optimization of health. Um, but we're, we're also, you know, taking into consideration today, um, you know, making sure that as providers, um, we're culturally competent um, with our patients and families. So, you know, certainly in the United States, um, you know, we do have a lot of immigration and migration mm -hmm. of peoples from all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they do congregate in areas uh, around our country where uh, they've got others um, just like them living in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's not new. That's been going on for hundreds of years. As right. People came over um, and kind of stayed with their own uh, from a, um, uh, an ethnicity perspective. Um, but, um, you know, each um, different uh part of, you know, one's heritage, um, you know, race, ethnicity, age, gender, um, the LGBTQIA plus community, geography itself, rural versus urban versus suburban. Right. <clears throat> we all bring those to the exam room, to the um, interaction with our provider um, to the point where we as providers then need to be <laughs> trained in that that aspect of cultural humility and empathy. So we understand where they're coming from and their fears, uh, concerns, um, questions about science and safety, things along those lines. Right. And and so we've been talking <laughs> value, which in some ways is, to me anyway, is about the individual pa patient, the individual's outcomes. But we started to head down with some of the things you were just mentioning towards this concept of population health, which I'm sure, sure some folks have seen as, you know, a, a key phrase, a buzzword, whatever you want to call it, out in the news beyond healthcare. So my second, so what is of the day? So what is population health? There are a lot of definitions to it. Uh, there's a standard definition um that that's out there but i think the best way to think of it is a collection of people um <clears throat> that um have some type of similarity um that puts them in um close proximity to one another uh that um one from a, a healthcare perspective uh needs to be aware of what we just talked about um, you know, uh, particulars to race, ethnicity, chronic disease, and such. So, for example, um, in Ohio Medicaid, there are different streams of populations that have been rated uh, in, in categories um, so that the managed care organizations are given X amount of dollars to pay for that care. So, it could be... Um, 
um, as as simple as um, you know a a healthy adult or mm-hmm. a healthy child. It could be um, a uh, um, a a person that has a chronic disease, like a diabetes or you know cardiovascular and the like. Could be those um, that are are truly um, you know uh, what we call um, aged, blind, and disabled. Mm. Um, it, it could be those that have a behavioral health problem. So that would be a mental health issue or a substance use disorder issue. And those particular groupings form a population of sorts of similarities that need then to be uh, managed in a different way than a, a different population. Um, and so we're seeing more and more of that covered um, and the Ohio Department of Medicaid um, recently starting their next generation of managed care in Ohio um, as of July the 1st uh, is um, way ahead of almost any other Medicaid plan in the country looking at how do we manage populations? How do we keep a system going so that people don't fall out of the system right. once they're in? Um well, also, um, you know, we have an incredibly high rate of mom and baby, um, you know, illness and death in Ohio. Um, and so that's a separate category of a population that is considered um, in and of itself uh, needing special um, considerations for physical health, for behavioral health, uh, for baby health, for child health, kind of all under one umbrella. Um, and uh, without getting into, you know, how payment structures, you know, happen, it's really more uh, of a clinical issue, making sure that we identify those vulnerable populations that really need the care and concern that we can give them as a healthcare delivery system at the state level, but also certainly at the federal level as well. And w- Within that, there's there's a couple interesting things that that um, you know I, I I didn't within your answer there that I'd like to look into or talk about. Just they may not be fully in your wheelhouse, so so steer me back on course if if we need to. But I remember learning some of the stats in Ohio, and so you know I might lose some out of state listeners here on this one. But um, we we've got uh, we do have a disproportionately high uh, rate of negative outcomes for for mother baby. And do you have any insight as to what's going on there in our state? I mean, um, anything that, that, um, stands out or that maybe somebody listening could do, could advocate for, could, um, you know, at least morally champion. I mean, what, anything going on there that you're aware of? Well, I think there's, there's a couple things to keep in mind. So, um, I think that the first piece has to do with, um, you know, providers um, giving uh, or being culturally competent mm-hmm. to the, the patients they're taking care of, um, you know, so that um, there there's no breakdown of communication, there's transparency, there's expectations of, of care and, and the like. Um, but we also know today that Um, structural bias and racism is a public health emergency, not only in Ohio, but across the country and globally as well. So uh, let's take an example of what that means. Um, So if if we have um, a group of um, Caucasian women um, who are healthy and pregnant, and we have a group of African-American women who are healthy and pregnant, same um, educational level, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, same um, uh, geography, um, pretty much same uh, income um, issues. The African American women are at three times the risk of their Caucasian um, women colleagues of having a preterm birth hmm. and or. Um, uh, you know, death uh, to the baby or to themselves. Hmm. Um, and and we know that um, because the studies that have been looked at, you know, comparing um, just those two groups, for instance, 
um, and seeing the differences tells us um, that we're not doing a good job of taking into consideration our own individual biases as providers. And again, it may be, you know, a, a, a complete unawareness on the provider perspective. Right. Um, that simply needs to be brought out through cultural competency training. But also, um, you know, it, it, it can also, you know, be um, as, as um, challenging then as um, overt racism, um, where um, certainly you've heard of redlining in neighborhoods. Um, this is where your zip code determines mm -hmm. your health more than anything else. Um, you know, African-American um, populations, you know, have been relegated to certain geographies within an urban uh, or rural setting um, where there may have been um, large industry um, mm. over the years that polluted, um, you know, the, uh, um, the geography uh, with harsh chemicals and such. So we see increased rates of uh, environmentally caused um, cancers uh, and other kind of chronic diseases. Um, so I, I think um, it's really important then to start talking about reporting on uh, being transparent and accountable to different races, ethnicities, geographies, um, you know, th those cultures uh, and, and educate um, ourselves as providers to understand them better so that then we can treat them better. And we should then see all things being equal, you know, those morbidity and mortality rates start to come down where they need to be um, in parallel with, you know, other cohorts. Uh, and, and in our discussion, you know, African-American educated uh, middle class women to Caucasian educated um, uh, middle class um, women. Uh, and, and I think that's a conversation um, that is just starting to be had. Um, there's reporting that is coming out um, that is um, demonstrating race and ethnicity um, as part of the data so that we can look to see whether or not we are making uh, improvements. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that's probably, you know, about three to five years away from having the impact that it needs mm -hmm. to level the playing field. One um, of the things you, that is really inter interesting to me in, in what you said there is, you know, when we talk about or we look at at, at the risk of, of uh, edging on the political realm here, which is not our goal, uh, but the the redlining some folks might say well you know that that process has ended so that the consequences are are done or whatever but what's fascinating i never really thought about till you just mentioned it is sure but pollution to groundwater can take 50 years 100 years you know toxins in the soil so some of those non-economic but truly ecological or environmental consequences of something like a, a redlining policy um, are can be multi-generational. And I think the proof of that should, should anybody feel like they need proof is Flint, uh, Michigan, yes. right. And the yep. water problems they have there. And, and somebody else on a different podcast can have a debate about the politics of that. But the bottom line is those kids are being harmed by that. And if, it's not fixed, then their kids will be harmed by that and, and so on and so on. So that's really a fascinating point within what you said about there, there can be environmental uh, lead paint in your house, right? If it's, if you've got an older house, it can, can affect you, can affect your kids, can affect your, your unborn baby, all these things. And, and some areas, uh, I, I bet, Appalachian houses have not been repainted, you know, you know, things like that. So there's, there's geographies in our country that may not have been those, those ecological elements, environmental elements may still be lingering and creating impacts. And so that's very fascinating to think about. Um, one of the other population groups you mentioned earlier, when you talk, when you were defining population health that I thought about, and I think you mentioned was behavioral health and mental health. 
folks who ha- are having challenges there. Um, without putting you on the policy spot, I mean, do you feel like the move towards value, patient-centric or person-centric care, the emphasis, the growing emphasis on population health is going to let us get a handle on mental health in the United States? Because I do think there's not a meaningful dispute that we have a mental health problem in the United States. Do you feel like these things are going to continue to improve over the next couple of years as the, the healthcare culture shifts? Well, I think uh, a couple of things. One is that um, we really need to get to a, a comprehensive integrated systems of care um, with what's called high fidelity wraparound services. So things that are really uh, you know, needed. Um, let, let's just take, for instance, um, you know, kids um, that are um, involved with the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been able to identify um, that many have serious emotional disturbance which could certainly then lead to serious mental illness for that's chronic. Right. Um, also, um, you know, we, we noticed that um, there's a, a high substance use uh, disorder uh, number in those kids as well. Um, they've had adverse childhood experiences that have not been addressed um, that linger. So, you know, without that integrated system, um, also, then taking into consideration, you know, their health and, and well-being, their developmental um, improvements uh, that um, a healthy child, um, you know, would experience. Um, we're, we're seeing many of uh, these kids fall through the cracks. So the the, the push today, um, certainly in the state of Ohio, is to carve out an inpatient model for just those kids say, you know, that are less than uh, 21 years of age meet um, criteria for admission into this special carved out program Mm -hmm. where they may need some residential care uh, and treatment um, for, you know, mental health, substance use disorder, comorbid chronic conditions and the like. Um, So I I think that um, more and more um, awareness of simply, you know, uh, depression, uh, anxiety disorder, um, you know, being two of the, the biggest ones and asking those questions. Um, our suicide rate in, in teens is um, way out of proportion, uh, especially teens, in the teens and veterans. It's tragic. Yes. Um, and, and again, so the VA has a, a, a special program now that they're working on called Whole Health where they do have the ability to integrate physical medicine and behavioral health medicine um, together to look at that whole person and manage all the other issues that they bring with them to the table, including the social determinants of health, food insecurity, housing insecurity, interpersonal violence, lack of education in jobs, um, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, things along those lines. So we've got all these little programs popping up around the country, um, but we're still not where we need to be as far as understanding it um, and using it um, and it becoming ubiquitous, um, regardless of where you are, you know, in the United States. So um, I think that's a, a huge, huge issue that we'll be seeing more and more uh, again, as we, we move along this continuum of, of comprehensive person-centered care, I will say the last thing related to that that's really important is um, if you compare us to other developed countries, um, you know, many of the developed countries have better outcomes as it relates to uh, patient care, um, health and well-being. Um, but they also have more dollars spent in the primary care space Mm -hmm. than what we do in the United States, which is flipped, where we have a lot less spending in the primary care space, yet primary care manages about 40 to 50 percent of all healthcare related issues. It's flipped um, when you go to the other developed countries um, and see their outcomes 
um, and their primary care spending versus the specialty care spending. Um, and we know that there's empirical support that focusing on specialty care instead of primary care does not guarantee increase in you know, outcomes uh, of, of care and that, that positive patient experience. Well, and implied within that, and I'm, I'm actually working, I'm hoping in an upcoming episode to have a statistician on, but implied in your point is you got to be careful comparing data sets, right? Because a, a dollar is not a dollar is not a dollar of expenditure, both with, with other developed countries within the United States, you know, wherever. And, and so that, that actually kind of takes me in a way I'll force it to, to my, an, another question I wanted to ask, which is how do we measure value in a way that might be meaningful to a patient, to a consumer trying to pick a, a doctor, trying to pick, you talked earlier about voting with their feet. So how can, how the heck can you even measure, measure whether the value of a local provider is any good? Well, um, today there's much more transparency and accountability than ever before. Uh, Medicare, um, has a star, um, a program uh, that ranks from one star to five star different quality um, quality of care measures. Um, uh, uh, an easy one uh, to think of is: Did your doctor offer you, you know, a flu vaccine if you're mm -hmm. over the age of 65 um, as part of a Medicare? Um, have you had a Medicare wellness um, evaluation um, for the year? Um, and you can see how your doctor rates on all of those, including how you rate your doctor from an experience perspective. Mm. Patient reported outcome measures um, are really focused on the experience. Um, most importantly, um, you know, would you recommend your doctor uh, to a family member or friend? Um, you know, that seems to carry the most. Uh, from an understanding of whether or not the experience is good, as if you would recommend somebody else, um, you know, to to see your doctor. Um, and so uh, we're we're now really having a chance um, to explain that. Certainly in the Medicare phase, on the Medicare side, plans are often um, uh, measured to some of those same types of of, of metrics of quality and experience. Um, and then compared uh, openly and published, um, you know, on the Internet for everybody to see, <clears throat> in which case then Medicaid uh, members or enrollees could pick the best plan mm -hmm. from a, a quality and cost perspective. Um, you know, so, again, we're starting to see more transparency and accountability. And I think that will drive uh, providers, physicians, those that are giving the, the health care itself. <clears throat> to want to be better, to want to provide a better experience for the patient, whether it's in the office or the hospital setting, or even a post-acute setting, uh, a skilled nursing facility, uh, a long-term uh, acute care hospital, uh, things that are uh, along that continuum. Um, and it'll be for physical health and behavioral health as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you're going to see more and more of that uh, and I think um, that it'll be um, easily available to anybody who wants to look at it um, probably within, you know, the next couple of years um, where you can just search on your doctor and it'll come up with all the different lines of, of business that they, they manage, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, right. um, you know, uh, TRICARE, which is military, uh, things along those lines. And. And you pointed people to the the Medicare, the STARS program, and um, my guest in episode four did as well. So I, I feel obligated to ask you the same question I asked um, that physician. And it's a mildly dangerous question, but it is, what about these third-party rating sites that I won't name because we won't pick on anybody? Should people trust those sites for evaluating the performance of their provider? Well, I, I think that um, you have to be careful because you don't want to mix apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. um, so the social media sites, you know, Facebook, um, Instagram, 
uh, some of the healthcare related sites where people can go on and literally type in, you know, an, a, uh, you know, a, a, a version or a vision of uh, how their experience was at their doctor's office. I think you take that into consideration uh, in addition to the other types of measures. I think they're equally as important uh, because they're really talking about the patient experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to um, remind everybody that the most important person who will make or break the patient experience in an ambulatory care setting is the receptionist. Hmm. The receptionist is the first contact of uh, the patient in, you know, that workflow that gets them in and out of that office. And if they start off with a bad experience for whatever reason, um, I used to remind everybody that it took an additional 20 to 30 minutes for me just to get to the point where I could get to their reason for coming to the office in the first place. Um, you know, so again, those are, I think, very important to take seriously. Um, I don't think you have to monitor them, um, but uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, patients will We'll say, you know, I, I went on online, I went to health grades. Um, I see that, you know, you had 20 or 25 reviews by patients that come to see you. Um, I looked through them, um, you know, I really liked what I saw. So I thought I'd come in and try uh, to see whether or not we're compatible. Um, you know, and, and that's where I think we're gonna continue to move. I think it's it's something that is uh, not going to go away. I think it'll continue uh, to evolve to the point where um, it'll become kind of a scorecard that each physician will take with them wherever they go, wherever they practice. Um, that's constantly being updated, um, you know, as to the experience and the quality measures that are important to the the person that you're taking care of. And so synthesizing all of the elements we've talked about and pivoting a little bit away from the patient to the actual physician, to the actual non-physician provider, so nurse, pra nurse practitioner, uh, physician assistant type of individual. Okay, so they've got to be focused on patient-centric care. They have to try to uh, do all the charting that you mentioned earlier. They have to try to think about those social determinants, the food, the housing, the environment. They have to be culturally competent. They also still have to manage a certain level of volume in order to keep the lights on or to keep their employer happy or whatever the case might be. They also have to, you know, uh, smile at you and have good side uh, bedside manner. They also have to deal with an aging population and therefore an increase in chronic diseases. As folks age, they typically gain chronic diseases. They also have to deal with the pandemic. They also have to deal with the politicization of their role. Therefore, many of them are starting to get burnt out. What is burnout and how do we help stop it from happening? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's a catch-all phrase for um, uh, basically an individual's um, well-being um, being at risk. Uh, so it could be um, that um, uh, because of what I call toxic stress, um, you know, there's a physiological response that's going on, and we know this in, in other populations that are at risk. Um, so there's metabolic changes that take place. There's inflammatory changes that mm. take place. <clears throat> there's uh, new neural pathways that are formed in the brain. Those are all related to that ongoing constant toxic stress of, uh, for the provider, the physician, the, the mid-level um, experiencing in their day-to-day -day activities to the point where eventually then um, it begins to potentially have uh, uh, ramifications on their nutrition, on their mm. uh, lack of exercise. Many begin smoking. Others um, have trouble. Um, so they begin coping with uh, certain types of illicit drugs and alcohol um, as a response to that toxic stress. So 
we're aware of it. We know that it exists. I don't think that we have um, found uh, a good way uh, to deal with it from a, a national perspective. Mm. I think we see pockets of improvement, um, you know, in uh, healthcare organizations um, where some are, um, you know, physiologically and psychologically better um, than others. Um, we see a lot of movement. Um, doctors moving away from the toxic healthcare delivery uh, systems to the ones that are more focused on the provider experience as being mm -hmm. part of the quadruple aim of transformation, um, you know, into uh, a, a new healthcare paradigm. So it, it, it's something that is getting worse, not better. Um, and I don't think it's, it's reached, um, um, you know, it, it's tipping point, but it's very close to the point where we're not going to have, you know, a lot of physicians um, anymore available to, to do the, the care that needs to be done, in which case some states have already started. Others will begin to look at uh, allowing mid-level practitioners um, to practice uh, on their own uh, through their own licensing board. Um, of course, with that comes responsibility and malpractice. Right. Um, you know, so there's there's uh, payoffs and um, and disadvantages um, to both. But I think that kind of covers um, a little bit about you know what burnout really is from the the physician perspective, mm -hmm. and that it is a physiological change within the body that then can cause other um, toxic events. Um, to occur, um, as as we we mentioned, that aren't necessarily thought of um, as a, a physiologic change. And thank you for breaking that down. And and, and if I understand my word use correctly, it, it actually it, it's pretty broad use in other industries now. But the the modern concept of burnout actually came from medicine. Um, yes. And and so, which is to me kind of fascinating by itself, but. So l let me ask you this, I suppose, um, just because I'm curious. With all that said, and I know this is a bit of a cheat question because I know what one of your adult children does for a living, but would you recommend to young people, to your kids, if you will, that they go into medicine then with all this ahead of them? Well, I, I you know, obviously to me, um, you know, I would say yes, but I would say it from a different perspective, and that is I would not discourage my children from pursuing a profession uh, in healthcare delivery um, and would, would be supportive. And, um, you know, my oldest son is a family physician um, and, and supported him through, um, you know, all of his education and residency training, you know, into um, his um uh, activities, you know, as a board certified family doc. Um, I, I, I think the if we don't improve on a couple of things that we've been talking about that I'll summarize in just a second. Um, again, I think we're going to go beyond the tipping point if we're not already there. Mm. So one is we have to educate on um, helping the next generation of healers become systems thinkers. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's uh, a new discipline called health system science that is a kind of a compilation of um, ways that uh, teach population health management, quality improvement activities, evidence-based medicine, value-based care, um, care coordination, um, you know, utilization uh, management, of medical services. Um, those are all grouped now under um, that one umbrella, and it's being taught um, in uh, many medical schools across the country, uh, not nearly enough hmm. in some, um, where others have embraced it, um, where it is a part, you know, the first couple of years of, of medical school training. Um, but but that, I think, is the the base of the pyramid of which we'll then um, build off of, uh, and we mentioned um, the importance of doing cultural competency training and, and really identifying how best to 
manage that patient and or family sitting across from you in the exam room. Um, uh, and what that does then is it helps us close health disparities by focusing on health equity, meaning that um, everybody has uh, the opportunity uh, to the same um, you know, care, uh, a treatment plan, and the like that anybody else would get. Right. But also uh, improving on what we call health literacy, where mm. we've got um, consumers really understanding um, how the healthcare delivery system works. A lot of the things that we've talked about today, that co-design in a care plan, those end of life decisions, having a, a durable power of attorney for healthcare, if if we don't do those two things, um, I don't think that we're going to have a, a successful, you know, healthcare delivery system in this country. Hmm. It will continue to, um, I think, deteriorate over time, um, and uh, we won't be able to break the cycle, um, you know, within the the generations of providers. Now, having said all that, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm somewhat um, always looking for the glass being you know, half full instead of half empty. Um, I think there's there's time um, to improve it in the, the medical schools and certainly in postgraduate medical education, residency and fellowship. Um, what my focus is, is teaching my contemporaries, uh, so my generation of providers, the basics of health systems science right now. Right. So that they understand population health management why do they have to focus on quality improvement? How important care coordination is, um, uh, team-based care, evidence-based medicine, value, and what, how value uh, can actually improve your overall uh, ability to manage your patients and families better uh, moving forward um, and get reimbursed for it. Um, as opposed to, you know, how many patients can I push through the office in an right. eight-hour day? So, you know, we have to we have to educate the current generation and the generations of healers to come, <clears throat> and we have to get on top of it within the next three to five years if we want to see some significant change. I think we will. Um, I think it's being measured, uh, and and I think it'll become ubiquitous um, through that time. Um, but um, like I said, you know, we've got to look at the entire life cycle of the physician, just as we look at the entire life course of the patient from even, you know, um, uh, preconception to end of life uh, in order for us to, to really, I think, make a difference uh, and be successful in that. So um, I'm always the, um, the optimist, never the pessimist. Well, I appreciate that positive view at the end here of what has turned into a uh, discussion on some very serious topics today. So I hope that folks have stuck with us through the end, that they learned something. Um, Dr. Block, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your um, information and your insight. And most of all, I appreciate there at the end, as you mentioned, trying to be part of advocating for that future that you see on the horizon for our health systems across the across the country. So thank you very much uh, for being here with me on No Bad Questions. Great. Well, thank you for having me, David. I appreciate it and certainly happy to come back um, if we get some interest in the individual topics that we talked about and do a deeper dive. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome.